This week on Wealth Track, the perspective of a longtime European resident and veteran stock kicker. Why T. Rowe Price's Dean Tenerelli is so upbeat about the future of unloved European stocks. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. According to a number of major Wall Street firms, we may be witnessing a big shift away from safe haven bonds into stocks. As Goldman Sachs chief global equity strategist Peter Oppenheimer put it, it's time to say a long goodbye to bonds and embrace the long goodbye for equities. And what's particularly notable is that the global equity bulls are not just high on U.S. stocks, they also like European stocks, which have been in the doghouse for a long time. This year, European stocks are in the plus column. The main reason is reduced worries about the Eurozone debt crisis. The recent European Central Bank's longer-term refinancing operation, known as LTRO, is providing cheap three-year loans to Eurozone commercial banks. That has sparked a big rally in global equities and been termed a game-changer for European stock markets. But some critics are worried that LTRO is setting up a future crisis as European banks become dependent on artificially cheap financing. The result could be a new credit binge, and as banks buy their own government bonds, the fate of the banks and their country's sovereign debt become intertwined. As one European observer told the Financial Times, it's like tying two drowning people together in the hope they will float. Nonetheless, there are reasons to believe that European stocks are now attractive. For one thing, they're cheap. Over the past five years, they were down by some 15% through the end of last year, down 27% for Eurozone stocks alone, as compared to U.S. equities, which were up 3%. From the U.S. perspective, that's made a lot of sense. All we have read about until recently concerning Europe has been about debt crises in Greece, Spain, and Italy, with no solutions in sight. Then there's Europe's slow to negative economic growth with high unemployment rates that have been endemic to the region. But our guest this week sees cause for optimism. He is London-based Dean Tenerelli, portfolio manager of the T. Rowe Price European Stock Fund. Tenerelli, an American, has been working as a money manager and living in Europe for many years, starting as an equity analyst in Madrid following Spanish stocks. Since 2005, he's headed T. Rowe Price's European Stock Fund, where he has consistently beaten the market and his category. In our recent interview in Paris, I asked Dean Tenerelli about his investment philosophy and his expectations for European stocks. Well, the fund is uh, designed to invest in the most profitable companies in Europe, uh, specifically companies with high return on capital employed, limited amount of cyclicality, so a company that typically can clear its cost of capital even in a down cycle. And through that, over time, to accrete uh, returns which are greater than market returns. Valuation is an, a core part of the fund because it's great to buy great companies, but you need to buy them cheaply or they don't work, they don't go up. Um, so I spend a lot of time on free cash flow analysis and DCF and earnings power of the company. So there's a very strong valuation discipline and I don't like to pay up for growth. So I typically won't have very, very high growth companies um, with very, very high PEs because I don't, I'm very skeptical of growth and how long it can last for. And I've always been investing this way after having been a telecoms analyst uh, in the late 90s and watching that. Um, so I picked up a few tips about growth and its sustainability and um, also a skepticism about it. So I concentrate very hard on um, taking growth out, um, being realistic with expectations, um, doing free cash analysis, figuring out how much the company's worth and then buying it at a discount. It doesn't matter if the company's growing or it isn't growing to me. 
How much attention do you pay to the macro picture in Europe, which has been a you know a dominant headline for the, ever since the financial crisis? Well, pre the crisis, I would have said zero. <laughs> Post the crisis, um, I think we need to be aware of it for market timing and for um, interesting entry points. It's actually shaping the fundamentals of what's going on at sectors like the banking sector where, or the insurance sector, where it is you know has been critical in um, forcing these companies to um, divest and to shrink uh, their balance sheets. So a macro is a factor. Let's call it 30 percent, 20 percent, not more. Depending on the market. Depending on the market. <laughs> the year and yeah. But, but the focus is companies and trying to get great businesses in the fund that are going to give me good returns over the next multiple years. So what is your assessment of the macro picture in Europe? Uh, um, there are a lot of skeptics still in the States looking overseas and they don't believe what's happening to the Greek restructuring. They don't think it's going to, it's sustainable. You're here. What's your view of, of the, the European macro picture? Well, I, I think it's right to be skeptical. Um, in Europe, outside Europe, um, there's a lot of debt in the world and there's a lot of uh, time going to take to pay off the debts. I think what's going on in Europe, and I think the LTO has been a game changer, um, has been a home run um, by the European Central Bank. Um, and, and again, that's the long-term refinancing operation. That's correct, right. of which they've pumped in about a trillion of liquidity gross into the banking system. And, and um, this is the ECB has pumped it in, is that, that is right? correct, mm -hmm. the ECB. What that has meant is that banks no longer have to finance for the next three years. Um, they are taken out of the market and they can, instead of financing in the market, they'll go to the ECB and they will get financing which has opened up and unblocked uh, credit markets completely in Europe, which in November of last year were completely closed. So additionally, though, it also shows that many people were skeptical that the European Central Bank was going to be able to act to fund the crisis and to stop the crisis and provide liquidity. Well, they have. Um, and the financing markets are wide open. Uh, the banks that we're talking to and meeting with are, have done, in some cases, half of the year's financing already, uh, just in the first quarter. It is a much better environment today than it was before. Um, so I think we are on our way to healing. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is the work that we're doing here in decreasing our debt burden and the target again for the EU is to bring it down to 3% of net debt to GDP by 2013. And, and where is it now? Uh, well, over, overall will be about 5 for the whole EU. Um, so bring that down to 3% and uh, 5 isn't such a great number uh, if you think about it. I mean, the U.S. is up at 8%. The key point I say that is because overall Europe, the cash is there. It's about spreading it. So then it becomes an issue of how to transfer this wealth and how, you know, how that becomes a social issue and a political issue, and that's the difficulty of it. Um, but I think what's happened uh, over the last six months is that it's unfolded that that is exactly what's happening um, at the cost of those governments which are receiving the night need to do austerity and they need to do the right things for their economy long term. And why I'm hopeful is because actually the measures that they're taking are good for their long term productivity. So this we're talking about labor market reform, we're talking about making it cheaper to hire and fire people. We're talking about um, pension reform. We're talking about limiting the power of wage increases and union strength in several countries. And this is the stuff that's going on in, in Spain and Italy in particular. I think Greece is a bit more difficult. It's a bit tougher doing the restructuring. But certainly in Spain and Italy, we are off to a great start with the new governments that we have. So I am quite optimistic um, for what they're doing. And I feel that when we get through this crisis, we will be in a great shape and will be competitive. And if I can draw one more parallel, it is similar to what Germany has done for the last 10 years, which was absorbing the East, doing their pension reform, limiting the power of their labor unions, and restructuring their economy so that, like magic, they were posting you know, well above average GDP growth over the last few years. That just shows you the strength of the reform measures that they've taken. This is the recipe for Europe, brought to you by the German government. So I'm quite optimistic that we'll get through this and, um, um, and also in a world that will have a lot of debt in a few years time, I think Europe will look relatively clean and restructured. So the political will then and the, the political wherewithal to, to restructure in a positive way mm. is, is there? And so, I mean, you sound much more optimistic than I've heard anyone else <laughs> uh, sound, but, but, but also a lot of the people that I talk to are, are analyzing the situation from the states and they're not actually here in the trenches. I am an optimist, so maybe I am uh, optimistic, but I feel the signs are there that things are moving ahead at a good pace. And so I am, I have to say, I am. There is, there, it's not without risks. Um, the risks, the principal risks, in my opinion, will be um, a, a big slowdown in the economy. Um, so if the GDP growth decelerates because of austerity measures, 
that will be a problem because we'll miss our targets. Um, that particularly is at risk in, you know, in Spain or Italy where they're really making a big chop at, at, at economic growth this year through these austerity measures. So we have to get through this year um, and it won't be without bumps. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of elections that we need to get through. Um, everyone is telling me that um, you know, the way things look now in all the elections, I think things will fall into place. Um, people, the governments will continue with the same measures which we've started um, without a shock to the Eurozone. So I, I really am a bit more constructive. Um, it's been, you know, a tough couple of years, but right. I think uh, the signs are there that we're doing the right things. You have to invest in Europe because you're running a European fund. Yes. But the rest of us don't have to invest mm -hmm. in Europe. So why should we even be bothered considering uh, all of it, you know, at the very least the headline risk well, that we're hearing about? It's very simple because over my career of investing, the time to invest is when there's crisis and the time to invest is when there are stress points. And in Europe now, there is a big stress point, and I think um, a lot of it is very misunderstood. So there's I mean, opportunity. The sovereign debt crisis. Sovereign debt crisis. A lot of it is misunderstood. And in the end, the ECB has come through, as I've said, and I think, um, I think it will continue. So investing in stress points always means value. And you can see the market is cheap. It trades at a, a big discount to the U.S. It's on you know, just over 10, 10 and a half times P.E. Um, these are very cheap multiples for Europe. You have great companies with good dividend yields, um, supported by cash, no balance sheet risk, and growth. Europe provides, for the average European company, 50% of their revenues come from outside of Europe. Something to keep in mind. So there's a global footprint by investing in European-based companies. There is a global footprint. Many European companies used to um, doing business internationally from the beginning um, have positioned themselves well in emerging markets, well in Asia, and for many of the companies, you know, consumer companies, um, emerging markets could be more than, just emerging markets could be more than 50% of their sales, which is quite, quite a figure. Um, and so you can get very good companies with good growth rates at very low multiples and great value right now. Um, so I think it is, and, and the time to do it is, is now before everyone figures that out. Among your peers and the market, you're, you, know, you are excelling. So what, what is it that sets your fund apart from other European-based funds? I think what's helped me is discipline in valuation and discipline in assessing uh, which are the good businesses that I want to own and spending all my time focusing on trying to find them. So focusing hard on understanding why a company is able to generate a return on capital much greater than its cost of capital over the long term and why that will continue for the next 5, 10, 15 years. They're the kinds of companies that I, I want to invest in. That's how I spend my day, um, talking with managements and understanding why uh, a cognac manufacturer can raise price 9% last year when we were supposed to be in crisis. And this well, is Pernod or? Uh, well, they all did. Oh, they all did. <laughs> so it's Pernod, it's Remy Cointreau, yeah, Remy Cointreau uh, both. So mm -hmm. um, it's just understanding why a company is, 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 is a good business and why it's great at what it does and investing in them. You know, one of the things that, that I know that Morningstar, uh, the, the, uh, the mutual fund analysis firm, um, mentioned in having a, a, assessing the Tiro Price European Stock Fund was that you invest in small cap stocks frequently and also in industrials. I mean, maybe that's something that you're doing right now. But the, the small cap opportunities uh, in Europe, are, are, they, are there terrific ones? Fantastic, or, and, fantastic. And, and what is it about small cap that's so appealing for um, you in the European theater? I think it, small cap is, is an example of an exaggeration of um, con, uh, risk aversion. So when the market gets risky, people get scared, they dump smaller stocks, they become very cheap and very mispriced. On top of it, a lot of the sell side ceases to cover them because it's not the most profitable uh, business to cover small caps. So they're very under-researched um, and they're very mispriced. Um, and I love mispriced companies that are, that are good businesses. And I think Europe in particular has a lot of good um, niche companies that might, even if they're small cap or mid cap, they might dominate a specific area. Uh, they might be the number one global um, provider of steam systems and manufacturing processes. Um, Such as? Spirex Arco. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can buy that on 15 times PE. It is a 28% return on capital employed company. It's a fantastic business. Um, and they are number one in what they do, but they're a mid cap company. You know, they're, not a, they're not a large company. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're the kinds of things that I try to find and, and get into my fund and hold on to for years if I can. And how important uh, is the, the aspect of the family-owned businesses and where you have you know, generations that are running the same kind of businesses? Is that very common in Europe it as is, well? Or? It is common and um, it is a theme and it is, um, I mean, I was doing meetings the last couple of days. I visit a number of family-run companies like Perno, like JC Deco, um, which are 
investing in their companies over the long term, and I find align their interest with shareholders over the long term. Because they are the shareholders They are the well. shareholders. Mm -hmm. And they are building a business and constructing a, a good profitable business with strong market share positions over the long term. Sometimes they're willing to invest and hit the profitability, and they explain that to us, and if it sounds reasonable, that's a good thing, and, and we stay with it, we like this, um, and these are the kinds of things that we seek to invest in, really. And, and what about you know the dividend policy? I know your your fund has what about a two and a quarter percent yield. Yeah. You're a U.S. citizen, but are are dividends more favored here than than they are um, in in the states, or you know is, is the, does the policy differ, or is it, or how important is it? Div dividends are interesting because you. I think it, it isn't it is important, but I think what's most important is that a good company with high returns will generally generate a lot of cash. So how they use that cash is important. Ideally, investing back in a business which is a high return business is the best outcome for, for shareholders in some ways because they can get a better return than I can with the dividend in some ways. So I'm happy to let them reinvest in their business and to grow. If, however, there, there aren't the growth opportunities in any given year or it generates so much cash that they really don't need to invest, which is fine with me, we'll take the dividend. Um, so I think a dividend is can be a symptom of a very, very good business throwing off a lot of cash, um, which is not capital intensive, and which therefore provides great shareholder return as well, either through the dividend or through shareholder uh, share price accretion. Uh, so we like dividends. Right now, according to Morningstar, your, one of your focuses is industrial companies. So, so why industrials? What, what's the attraction there in Europe? Right. I think the industrials provided another example of what I just said, which are European companies, um, great European companies, which have a great international footprint and are benefiting by uh, world growth, specifically in emerging markets. So in some cases in Europe, you'll be getting 40 to 60 percent revenue exposure in these companies into emerging markets. They're good companies with good technological advantages. Um, they invest in their R&D um, and, and have high returns. Um, so I think they're a very attractive uh, area of the market to be in. Um, they are not without fluctuations, and, and the economy accelerates and decelerates, but we have, over the last even eight years, been adding to our positions um, in industrials when things look like they were getting weak, um, because we are a big believer still on the industrialization of China, the industrialization of emerging markets, um, and these companies are well positioned through a profitable way to play um, this industrialization and growth. So in the United States, we have an impression that Europe is not business friendly because of a number of factors, including you know, labor unions and high tax rates and bureaucracy. Is that a misperception? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I think there, there is a more rigid labor market in Europe. And I think there are difficulties and expenses in uh, hiring and firing um, and in uh, Social Security contributions. So I do think that portion of it is something that is being worked on now and needs to be changed. Um, so I think that aspect of it is true. But as far as is it unbusiness friendly, I think there are enough profitable uh, companies in Europe with great businesses that, that are doing quite well that would show that it isn't necessarily true uh, on the other side. Market correlation at one point went to one in various stages of the financial crisis and the aftermath in that no matter you know what your company was doing versus another company, all European stocks got tainted with the same brush and went down. Very frustrating for investors and professional money managers such as yourself. Has the correlation now started to, to widen in, in that quality companies are being recognized again. I mean, do you feel like the markets are being are returning to some more sense of normalcy? I think that's a very good point. And we've been through, a, it, it really creates, as a fund manager, creates a lot of worry um, because you don't understand what, is it you or are you missing something? So I think it's a, a very valid point. And I think, yes, um, I think since the last, since the LTRO package, I think the market is once again uh, investing in stocks. And I feel that uh, the movements in the market are more rational. I do. I can see th certain holdings of mine which have, have behaved in certain ways or PE multiples which are starting to get re-rated and they are, they, they are logical to me. So I feel like the market is much more rational now than it was uh, the, during the sheer panic time. So your homework can pay off, which is, must be a relief at any rate. So l let's talk about some of your, your holdings and, and that is just, um, I get you're pretty focused fund, relatively focused. You've got yeah. 64 stock holdings. And your annual turnover is what, 60%? 60%, uh -huh. right, spot on. And, and so, which is lower than the average, but it's still, you're still managing what, so that means that you're holding a stock for a couple of years? Yes, just yeah. under. 
talk to us a little bit about a couple of the companies that, that would be emblematic of, of the kind of investments that you're making. I'll talk about one which I bought recently, actually, which is an co Italian company called Todd's. Um, which is a shoe manufacturer and retailer. Oh, sure, and Todd's. Shoe, shoes Very high-end, high driving end. shoes, right. right. Great products, great brand. However, it's one in Italy, um, which has been a market which has been difficult. 50% um, of their sales are into Italy. 70% um, are into Europe. So the market has panicked on Todd's and, and the slowdown that might ensue. Uh, they had a weak Q4, especially after the Italian uncertainty around the Italian elections. The consumer was very, very nervous um, and, and did withhold on spending and they had negative like for likes. And this is the kind of uh, situation that we like to buy into. It's a, it's a quality company. Uh, it's a company which would do 20, 26% EBIT margins. Fantastic business. Um, they are, again, a family owned business investing for the long term. Self-financing? Self-financing, net cash. Um, um, and you're buying it now on 16 times PE for a company which will, even in a bad year like last year, will do a 12% sales growth and 9% organic sales growth. So it actually has a great growth outlook, has a great balance sheet, investing for the long term, and has been absolutely slammed because of the uh, worries about the European consumer. And I know that we'll get through it and the brand will be much stronger uh, coming out of it. So these are the kind of things that we like to to invest in. So that's a consumer company. What about what, what about in the industrial space? Um, industrials, we've added to, we've been in industrials as, as, you, as you've mentioned and, and, and you know. Um, recently, I haven't added to it. You needed to add to industrials in November of last year when the crisis was uh, at its worst mm -hmm. point. Um, and, um, but the industrials that I do hold, which was Spirex Arco, which is uh, the steam um, engineering company, which I mentioned. I also own SKF, which is a ball bearing manufacturing company based in Sweden. It is a quality, um, quality business, again, high return on capital business, uh, very well exposed to emerging markets. Um, actually, I did recently add to it, they had, a, um, uh, again, a weak uh, Q4 report, just on a slight slowdown in, in, in China. Um, and um, I added into that as well. So SKF is another uh, holding which I'm very comfortable with and uh, has proved to be a great business over, over the long term. Is there any macro issue on the horizon? I mean, you know, the markets seem to be focusing on a, any, a given trouble spot at any time. I, 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 is there a, one trouble spot that you're saying if, you know, if, if Spain goes, if X goes, then we've got some real problems again? The thing that worries me most is the real economy and what the effects will be of austerity this year. Um, what is tr a, being attempted in Spain, i.e. cutting the net debt to GDP by such an extent um, in one year's time is tough. And I don't think it's ever been done before. So these are significant um, changes which are going on in the real economy. So we need to watch the GDP figures. A healthy world, the U.S. accelerating, uh, China continuing uh, strong will help Europe. Um, there are all open economies here and they will benefit from that. But what, what, what will worry me the most is that um, we sort of slip down into a downward spiral on GDP growth and then the debt targets are not made and then you spiral down again. So what I'm most concerned about is watching the economy. So, so Dean, the final question I always ask everyone in WealthTrack is in a long-term diversified portfolio, is there one thing that we should all own some of? Uh, Stock-wise, I, I, I thought I knew you were going to ask this question because I know you <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I was preparing Todd's for this because I really think it is a business which you can invest in and hold on to for 10 years, be comfortable that your, your, your returns will be managed well, that it will be much bigger in 10 years time, the company will have expanded uh, dramatically, uh, they will have grown dramatically in Asia, grown dramatically in the US. Um, and um, expanded the, the brands even. So I, I, am, and I am very comfortable with that stock actually, and I think it's a great entry opportunity now. Well, I am very comfortable with their shoes and handbags as well, <laughs> I can tell you that myself. So Dean Tenorelli, thank you so much for joining us from the Tour Price European Stock Fund. And I think, you know, I feel much better having talked to you about Europe, uh, which I appreciate, and I'll, I will definitely, I'm sure I and our viewers will look at Europe again. Good, thank you very much, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Dean. At the conclusion of every wealth track, we try to leave you with one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is a contrarian one. It is consider investing in some unloved European stocks. American investors tend not to have enough foreign stock exposure to begin with, so this may be a good time to add an undervalued international component to your portfolio. And one of the most unloved sectors of international stock markets is Europe. 
As Dean Tenorelli just pointed out, many European companies are really global firms with more than half of their sales coming from outside Europe. So a European fund is not only a way to participate in a long-term European rebound, but it may also be a way of participating in emerging market growth, since many European firms are strongly established around the world. Next week, we welcome great investor guest Kathleen Gaffney, but the co-manager of the legendary Loomis Sales Bond Fund says stocks are the next big thing. We'll hear why she's favoring dividends over interest for higher income. If you want to see our WealthTrack interviews ahead of the pack, subscribers can do so 48 hours in advance. To sign up, go to our website, WealthTrack.com. You can also watch previous shows and find past one investment and action point recommendations. And that concludes this edition of WealthTrack. Thank you for watching, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Thank <laughs> you.